Third indictment, a failure to address man's malady. When I look at the book of Romans, which is one of my favorite books of the Bible, it is not a systematic theology, but if you could say any book in the Bible was a systematic theology, the book of Romans would be the closest. Isn't it amazing that Paul spends the first three chapters of that book seeking to do one thing, bring all men into condemnation. Bring all men into condemnation. But it is not that condemnation is his great sunum bonum in his theology. It is not his end or his final purpose. It is a means to bring salvation to his readers. Because men must be brought to a knowledge of self before they surrender self over to God. Men are made in such a fallen manner now that you must cut away from them absolutely every hope in the flesh before they be brought to God. This is important in everything, but it's especially important in evangelism. I remember, this was, I was 21 years old and had just been called to preach. And I walked into an old store where they would sell suits to ministers for half price. They'd been doing it for 50, 60 years. And I walked in there and I was looking for a suit in Paducah, Kentucky. And all of a sudden, the door opened. I heard the bell ring and it closed. There was an old, old man standing there. I never caught his name, but when he walked in, he looked right at me. He said, boy, you've been called to preach, haven't you? I said, yes, sir. He was an old, old evangelist. He said, you see where that building is right outside this building? I said, yeah. He said, I used to preach there. The Spirit of God would come down and souls would be saved. I said, sir, please tell me about it. He says, there wasn't anything like this evangelism today. He said, we would preach for two and three weeks and give no invitation to sinful men. We would plow and plow and plow and plow the hearts of men until the Spirit of God began to work and break their hearts. I said, sir, how did you know when the Spirit of God was coming to break their hearts? And he said, well, let me just give you an example. He said, many decades ago, I walked into this store to buy a suit. Someone had handed me $30 and said, preacher, go buy you a suit tomorrow. And when I walked through the door, the young clerk taking care of the shop turned around and looked at me. And when he looked at me, fell down on the floor and cried out, Who can save a wicked man like me? And I knew that the Spirit of God had fallen upon the place. Now we just walk in and talk to them, give them three exploratory questions and ask them if they want to pray a prayer and ask Jesus to come into their heart. And we make a twofold son of hell who will never again be open to the gospel because of the religious lie that we as evangelicals have spewed out of our mouth. I'll say something that Leonard Ravenhill used to say. Now you understand why I preach in a lot of places once. But that is the truth. When we treat sin superficially, first of all, we are fighting against the Holy Spirit. And He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin. There are very popular preachers today who are more concerned about giving you your best life now than they are eternity. And they brag about the fact that they do not mention sin in their preaching. I can tell you this, the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with their ministry, lest He be working against it. That would be the only thing. Why? When a man says he has no ministry dealing with the sin of men, the Holy Spirit does. It is a primary ministry of the Holy Spirit to come and convict the world of sin. And so know this, when you do not deal specifically, passionately, lovingly with men and their depraved condition, the Holy Spirit is nowhere around you. Also, we are deceivers when we deal with the malady of men lightly. Like shepherds of Jeremiah's day, 
They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially saying peace, peace, but there is no peace. We are not only deceivers, but we are immoral, like a doctor who denies his Hippocratic oath because he doesn't want to tell someone bad news because he thinks that person will be cross against them, will be angry with them, will be sad. And so he does not tell them the news most necessary to save their life. I hear preachers today, they say, no, 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 no. You don't understand, Brother Paul. We're not like the people of the day of John and Charles Wesley. We are not like the culture that Whitfield addressed or Edwards. We're, a, we're not as hardy as they are. We're broken. We don't have as much self-esteem. We're feeble. We can't bear such preaching. Listen to me. Have you ever studied the lives of these men? What they preach, their culture couldn't bear it either. No one has ever been able to bear the preaching of the gospel. They will either turn against it with the fierceness of an animal or they will be converted. And to give you a thing about us being more feeble and not having the self-esteem, our country and this world is overrun with this disgusting malady of self-esteem. Our greatest problem is that we esteem self more than we esteem God. We are also thieves when we do not speak much about sin. We are thieves. Let me ask you a question. This afternoon, this morning, where did all the stars go? Did some cosmic giant come by in a basket and pick them all up and throw them in and carry them someplace else? Where did all the stars go this morning? They were there, but you couldn't see them. But then the sky grew darker and darker and darker. And as that night turned black as pitch, the stars came out in the fullness of their glory. When you refuse to teach on the radical depravity of men, it is an impossibility that you bring glory to God, His Christ, and His cross. Because the cross of Jesus Christ and the glory thereof is most magnified when it's placed in front of the backdrop of our depravity. She loved much because she's been forgiven much. And she knew how much she had been forgiven because she knew how wicked she was. Oh, we're afraid to tell men of their wickedness. And they can never love God because of it. We've robbed them the opportunity to boast not in self, but to follow the admonition, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 